This episode is brought to you by Bumble. So you want to find someone you're compatible with, specifically someone who's ready for a serious connection, totally open to having kids in the future, is a tall rock climbing Libra, and loves rom-coms with vegan pizzas on Tuesdays just as much as you do. Bumble knows that you know exactly what's right for you. So whatever it is you're looking for, Bumble's features can help you find it. Date now on Bumble. Hey there. Did you know Baker's always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Baker's app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Baker's today. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. The Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. Hello and welcome back to the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. I'm your host, Rebecca Larson, and I am joined once again today by my great friend, Dr. Emma cahill Moron. Emma, welcome back. Hi, Rebecca. How are you? Uh, I you must be sick of having me on the show. <laughs> I feel like I need to have like a special introduction song where I sing your name or something and make it like this whole thing. Well, you know, be my guest. <laughs> I like the idea, the sound of it. <laughs> well, you know, you are just a wealth of knowledge when it comes to the Spanish monarchy and the responses that we've been getting from previous episodes together on this topic have been amazing. And people, the listeners are really enjoying this topic. And so I invited you back again today to kind of maybe fill in some blanks, maybe is is the best yeah, way to describe yeah. it. Yeah, you're right. I, I well, first of all, thank you for all those lovely comments. I love, I think I'm, I might take the stage name, Dr. Emma. I like that. Um, so, you know, Stay tuned, maybe. Um, and it's just, you know, it's so easy to talk to you, Rebecca. And and I feel like we complement each other very well because there's so much I don't know about the Tudor court, especially since I am, I, I my first approach was more in the end of the 15th century, the reign of Henry VII, and then the reign of, the early reign of Henry VIII, really. But I'm learning so much from you from a time period. I'm so interested because I am moving on into uh, Mary the first and all that time. So I, I just think it's great. It's like perfect combination, right? I think so it thank is. You for, thank you for inviting me back. Oh, it's a, just always so much fun to have you back. I'm sure there are other people who want to be on the show, but I just want Emma all the time. No offense <laughs> to anybody else, but <laughs> I can interrupt more than one person. So you can invite another <laughs> that's my goal today is not to, not i'm not going to interrupt rebecca that's my goal i'm going to try really hard we'll see we'll see how this turns <laughs> out <laughs> okay so today let's you know what do you want to talk about today so i you know because of all those lovely comments that i was and and it seemed to me like there was people who wanted more on the daughters of isabel they are really coming out of the dark now. There's a lot of work being done on them. Um, so shout out to all those researchers in Spain, mainly. There's other places too, because for example, Juana goes into Flanders. So there's other researchers involved, but in Spain, people are doing a great job now. Um, especially in our um, in our research group, Arte Poder y Genero, we have focused on them for a long time. So for example, my coworker, Melania Soler Moraton, she did her PhD on the devotion of these four women. Um, and then, for example, my good friend, Ruth Martinez Alcorlo published the first biography of the eldest. So Isabel, named like her mother, this was published in Spanish by Silex uh, in 2021. So, I mean, there's a lot of work being done on them. And I think people want more because in those comments that I was reading the other day, it seemed like they're very unknown, but people like them, don't you think? I think so too. We know so much about Catherine mm -hmm. and we know so much about Juana, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but these other sisters do seem to have been left in the shadows because we maybe don't have such a strong connection to the Tudor court. Could that be why? Um, I think one of the main, obviously Catherine Aragon is famous because she becomes so relevant in the Tudor court and that's, she's always going to be famous in England and, and anyone who is interested in the Tudors. 
Um, in the case of Juana, she does become this, she becomes queen, reina propietaria, so queen regnant, more or less the equivalent. And she has this tragic life. So I think she's just a mythical kind of uh, uh, historical figure, really. So a lot of people know her because of, uh, not not because she was a ruling queen for other reasons, right? But these two other sisters are unknown, I think, abroad. I think Maria is a really the one that nobody really knows a lot about, uh, despite the fact that she was very important, and we can talk about that. But then Isabel, the eldest, she is a, a, a somewhat well-known figure in Spain because she's very important for all the alliances that the that Isabel and Fernando forge, especially with the Kingdom of Portugal. And that we've talked about this, but I don't just refresh it for anyone who, who hasn't um, listened to the other episodes. In, in the late Middle Ages, in the Iberian Peninsula, the monarchs like Isabel and Fernando had the idea that the Iberian Peninsula could be unified under one monarch. So their first goal was always to establish an alliance with Portugal because they had had problems with them too. So these are kingdoms. It sounds a bit like the <laughs> the development of everything in England too in the 15th, late 15th century. It's because it's happening at the same time. Yes, it's so Isabel is important in Spain. She's now with this biography, obviously starting to get her place more. But we still, there's still many things people don't know about them. Honestly, when it comes to those two, I really, all I know is they shared a husband and not in that, you know, like <laughs> that maybe that was kind of weird to say that. <laughs> not at the you same know, time. <laughs> with the Trastamaras and the Hasbergs and marriages, nothing surprises me anymore. So you, and when you said it, I was like, I guess you're right. They did share a husband. Uh, not at the same time. This is not the two to court. <laughs> but, um... But yes, uh, successively, because this alliance was so important. So it sounds weird, but it's not weird when you understand the development of the <clears throat> historical development of the monarchies in the Iberian Peninsula. Let's begin by saying something that we said before to Isabel and Fernando were cousins. <laughs> so <laughs> what? Uh, what? <laughs> yes, they were cousins. And also Isabel's mother was Portuguese. And she had been brought up in Arevalo with a Portuguese court, not in the court of Henry IV of Castile. Oh, we're starting to get com the complexity of the names here. So I, I want to I want to try and make it easier today than just give a ton of, tons of names. So the important thing to remember is that for Isabel, Portugal was always key because she had had a big conflict. She had really she had to fight for for her throne and. Portugal had helped the other candidate, Juana de Castilla, the so-called Juana la Beltraneja. Juana la Beltraneja was the legitimate or illegitimate daughter of Henry IV of Castile. And a civil war broke out when he died because Isabel said, no, you're not legitimate, so I'm the queen. So that alliance with Portugal was always crucial because Portugal had helped this other candidate. And she lived. She lived for many years. She was imprisoned. In a convent. <laughs> I yes. should be surprised. It seems like there's a pattern there. <laughs> I, 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 can't, I can understand that the fascination with Trastamaras and Hasbro is that you've got poison, you've got um, cousins that marry, you have imprisonments. It's it's great. It's great. It's um, We should maybe write a TV show or something. I was just going to say, yeah, <laughs> it sounds even better than the Tudors, all the drama that happened in the Tudors dynasty. That It's just as much over there. Well, I don't know. The tutors are pretty intense. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we don't. Was there a Spanish king who beheaded two of his wives? No. There you <laughs> the go. The short answer is no. The long <laughs> answer is no. <laughs> no, but for example, something really cruel that happened to one of the daughters of Isabel is that Ferdinand of Aragon imprisoned his own daughter, Juana. So, you know, right. that's intense if you think about it. Uh, and he didn't let her rule. So, uh, I mean, he wasn't, I mean, there, there's still, uh, there's still very dramatic things that happen in this court. For example, uh, forcing uh, his, and this is Isabella too, forcing their children to marry. Uh, for example, in the case of Isabel, the eldest, she was betrothed to the heir of the Portuguese crown for forever. And then when they marry in 1490, 
he dies like five months later. <laughs> so she becomes, yeah, she's a widow and she comes back to Brazil and she doesn't want to marry. She wants to become a nun. You know, and I was talking to, I'm mean, lucky enough that I am friends with Dr. Ruth Martinez Algoro, who wrote her biography. So this again, I take from people. I'm not, this is not my work. But Ruth Martinez, I, I asked her, I was like, I'm preparing for this podcast. Can you give me some hints about what, what things Isabel is relevant for? And she was telling me that she is crucial because for a long time, she takes back her power because she doesn't want to marry again. And she's like, no, I want to be a nun. Because think about it. Maybe now we think being a nun is something that is not um, something we associate with freedom. But in the 16th century, in the end of the 15th century, for a woman, it was. Because in Spain, widows could, um, well, they had properties. Women had properties and they had titles and things like that. But also they could use their money. If you had a husband, then it's your husband who's managing your money. And so... Isabel, for many years, she's like, I don't want to marry again. I want to become a nun. But her parents are like, I, we don't care. You're the eldest and you have to do this. And finally, she has to go on and marry. So they marry things like, you know, when you say the two sisters marry the same guy, they didn't have a choice. Because Isabel then goes on and marries this king of Portugal. Uh, she's pregnant and then she dies after having the baby. The baby dies two years after, so her sister has to go in and fill her in her shoes because the alliance with Portugal is too important. So these women, really, if you think about it, they didn't have much choice. And in, in the way that their parents, it sounds like, oh, their parents were awful. They didn't have a choice either because the civil war could have been very, could have had a very bad end for, for this family. So it's just a matter of survival, really, and of realizing that the times are changing we're at the end of the middle ages and the beginning of the modern state and t things are changing very very quickly so they they are in a pivotal time really too so that's why they're so interesting to study yeah so you mentioned that <laughs> maria was important can you elaborate on that a little bit what was her importance in all of this well, let's let's place her right. So let's just do a, bit, a very quick refresh of of the children of the Catholic monarch. So there's Isabel the elder. She's born in 1470. We're talking about, you know, it was still in the 15th century, and for another eight years, she's the only one. So she becomes princess, not infanta. We talked about this. That she was princess of Asturias because she was the firstborn. Her neck, the, the sisters that followed were infantas because they were not the firstborn. And the moment that her brother is born, she, she, she's not the heir anymore because he becomes the heir. Uh, he's Juan, so, but he's eight years younger than her. So for a long time, while that war is still raging, Isabella has a little baby girl. So she has a very tough life. And she's sent to the Portuguese court to become basically hostage. Um, yeah, for this marriage, mm -hmm. because she's the guarantee that the peace is going to be kept. So basically, that's what you get when you're a firstborn <laughs> girl. Then there's Juan, the heir. Um, and of course, we have to remember that he's the only boy. So it, he is, is raised in <laughs> very carefully, but also there's a lot of ang angst because, you know, if something happens to him, what are you going to do? Uh, the following year, and I think this is remarkable about Isabella of Castile, the following year, she she has three other kids like in, in five, six years. So I think once she had the boy, she relaxed in a way. The war had ended and that's how it works, you know, sometimes. Mm. So she has these three girls in succession and that allows uh, Juana, we've talked about her, Maria, who we will concentrate on now, and then Catalina, Catherine of Aragon. And the thing is that... Uh, when Maria is born, really, or, or Catherine, especially when Maria is born, um, she is not born at a time where another prince is born, like Arthur, for example, like Catherine, because Catherine becomes relevant for the Tudors right away. Uh, she's not even the first daughter or the second daughter. So she just becomes a daughter of the king and queen and basically the, the one who's like waiting to see what happens with the rest, right? So that's why when her sister dies, she she goes on to marry the king of Portugal. But she's very important because when she goes to Portugal, in her case, she has 10 children. Wow. Yeah. She has 10 children with Manuel, the first 
So, and her children, because Manuel and Maria were developing this Renaissance in their court, and Manuel is very known for this, even the architecture is named after him, the uh, El Estilo de Manuelista, no? Manuelino, I think it's called, uh, in architecture and things like that. He was very important. His children were educated with all the advantages that had been uh, developed in the in the Portuguese court and Maria, who comes from the court of Isabel and Fernando. So these 10 children become exceptionally important in the history of um, Europe, really. And we've talked about one of them, Empress Isabella of Portugal, right? Right. Um, so anyone who wants to hear about her, she we talked about how remarkable she was. So it, Maria becomes very important in the same way her sister Juana becomes very important because they have many children. And those children go on to be kings, queens, and emperors. So that is part of their success. But she pays a high price because she dies after one of these, um, she has one of these babies. So in some cases, they have difficulties to have children. In other cases, they just die from it, even after having 10 children. Imagine that. Right. That's the crazy part is that she made it that many births. And mm -hmm. who knows, did she have miscarriages in there too? That's possible. I'm sure it was. Uh, I don't think she had a lot of time to have miscarriages in this case. I think with the Trastamara women, we see very well the ones that didn't have so many problems had many children. And the ones like Catherine that did had many pregnancies, but not many children. Hmm. Almost and like in it. The it yeah. might have been something wrong with maybe Henry VIII. <laughs> Guess what? I think you might be right. And I think, I mean, it's totally, it makes total sense to me that there was something wrong with him. I mean, it, I know, and people have this different study that have been even yeah. done to, but yes, it seems like it, it was him because he had trouble with uh, his other wife. So, I mean, <clears throat> and his, he had one, a couple of sons and they both die when they're teenagers. Right. right. Yeah. So, yeah, it was probably and it was probably both. It's just 16th century is a brutal time. Uh, each pregnancy is a risk. Each birth is a risk. Infection. They didn't have anything for those kind of things. I mean, Jane, C Jane Seymour. We, we there's so many women. There's so many women that die from these issues. That's why women don't get to be old in, in the 16th century. You know, the men die in yeah. war. The, me the women die giving birth. Oh tragic right i thought for sure you were gonna say something about Catherine parr in there too but it's fine not today i guess <laughs> oh you can talk like you can i'm sure you've got some bombs there come on rebecca no us. no 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 this isn't this isn't interviewing me day <laughs> we'll, we'll turn this back to your topic <laughs> okay okay but yes yeah, so maria in that sense has that power that she does give 10 <laughs> possible successes to the Portuguese court. And then, because as we know, the Trastamanas like to marry the cousins and all that. If you give a lot of children, then you have a lot of power to negotiate with those other courts. Think about it. And now we're in the Portuguese court, not in Spain. Uh, so Maria and, and Manuel, when they have 10 children, the Spanish court, uh, all the relations with, they, they had a relation with England too. So uh, for example, Flanders, I mean, it's just, it, it's a power really to have a lot of children when you are a royal couple and it, it's a mark of success. So Maria in that sense is very successful, but because she dies um, after childbirth, um, she doesn't, she, she doesn't live a long life. Like for example, her sister Juana does. Juana is the one that lives the longest. Juana doesn't die until 1555. Whoa. I you know, I think you tell me this every time we talk about her and it surprises me every time. Yeah. 15. Okay. So Mary was on the throne. Yep. So she got to see her niece become queen regnant. Uh, she had news that people would visit her. Let me check that it was 1555. Or I think she, because her son I mean, all the time that her son is ruling, she's really, she's the queen. She's the one that appears in the documents. Um, so, too. So she's there with, with Charles V. Yeah. He's, so, he's ruling really in her name, if you think about it. So she would have known about Lady Jane Grey 
and what was happening there. And then it makes me wonder if she did anything to help Mary regain her throne or claim her throne. I know that she was very old at that time. She did die in 1555. I know her health declined a lot in the last few years. So I don't know how aware she would have been or how able. I know that the first years that she was in prison, she did have a lot of contact with other, uh, like her sister Catherine. And we've talked about this before. Catherine tried to bring Juana to to England to marry Henry VII. Um, And remember that Juana had been in the Tudor court for over a month with her with her um, husband, Philip, um, before he died under very uh, mysterious circumstances in Burgos. We talked about that too. So there was a lot of contact between the sisters early on. And then I think uh, in the last years of, of uh, Juana, her, her health was too bad probably. to And her someone who's in prison for that long doesn't do well. You know, so yeah, she wasn't doing well at the end of her life. Of course, no. I always wonder how lonely she was. Well, these people are imprisoned with spies. Juana, in the case of Juana, she's even she's uh, abused, physically abused by people uh, who are taking care of her. This is not. I don't think people had the. <laughs> the bandwidth to to think about mental health in the terms we think about it nowadays. So they had full authority to do whatever it took to make them comply. And Juana did have a very, um, she didn't accept very well things she didn't like, uh, as is you know very normal for someone. It's just she, it's not her fault really. But on the other hand, these people that were with her also had orders to do whatever they needed. So this is a time where people's mental health is not considered. And she was a, a think about it. She's a very important, despite the fact that she is imprisoned, she's still a threat. In 1520, just when Charles, so Charles V was king of Spain, but he had never been to Spain. So when uh, Ferdinand of Aragon dies and Charles V becomes the the heir and, and the new king of Spain, he has to visit Spain because he's never been there. He doesn't even speak Spanish. So there's a revolt against him. And these people go to see Juana in Tordesillas, where she's imprisoned, to ask her, no, you're the queen. We want you to be the queen. Um, and, and this has to stop, this madness of this foreigner. Because one of the, the sons of Juana had been raised in Spain. In one of her trips, she had a son called Ferdinand, like his grandfather, and he had stayed there. So people said either you or and there was another faction that were um, in favor of, of, of the Infante Fernando. So what Charles does, he sends his brother to, I think is Austria. So he's like, you can go and, and do your thing over there and serve me there. And then in the case of Juana, he's very lucky because she does not cave. Just, she's what I, I'll... I'll I'll listen to you. What are your concerns? I'm the queen. So she's exercising there her queenly status of listening to concerns, right? But at the same time, she says, I will not sign anything to put my son's uh, inheritance under, you know, under threat or under. Mm -hmm. So really, this has been an argument to say that she wasn't really mad and that she was just uh, cast away because she she had a personality that wasn't fit for the women at the time, right? Because she wouldn't shut up when something was unfair. Mm-hmm. So this is why I like Juana so much, you know? Because we can she, relate to that. She's so underrated. And so. I hate to make this comparison, but I do see some similarities to Anne Boleyn and her imprisonment and her voice and what happened to her. Exactly. And a hundred percent. And this is, this tells you, uh, it's very telling of how your personality can really play against you in a, in a, especially when you're a woman, especially when you're a woman. And this is in all the treaties of the time, educational treaties and the treaties of, of Juan Luis Vives that he wrote for Mary Tudor. Um, uh, and, and it's women have to be virtuous. So they have to be prudent. So they have to be, Basically, you had to be a very good player and you had to have a lot of self-control and self-restraint because the king 
would humiliate you in public often. Henry VIII humiliated Catherine of Aragon many times in public. It was her reaction to it that uh, when it doesn't go down in history, it's because she just exercised that restraint and said, okay, I'll talk to him in private. Other times she did express her, I mean, for example, when he wanted to go to to the Field of Cloth of Gold to, to meet with Francis I of France, the, all the ambassadors are like the queen. I mean, they were surprised because she's like, no, no, I don't see this happening, Henry. Sorry, no, no. And then when he grows that beard, you remember he grows a beard and he says, to, she, the ambassadors are like, the queen doesn't like it. He's going to shave it off because the queen is like, no, 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 thank you. I don't like that beard. So there's times when they do affirm their power too. And in the case, I think uh, what it shows very well is it, the in these cases, and, and let's talk about Anne Boleyn, is the, the favor you have from the king. So during the time that she has favor with the king, she can say many things and she can do many things that then when she loses favor, she cannot. I always remember that instance after the death of Catherine, because Catherine of Aragon dies, then Anne Boleyn has a miscarriage on Catherine of Aragon's funeral day, right? right? We all know that. And after that, everything goes south between Anne and Henry. And mm. what does Henry say to Anne when she's uh, raising concerns about what's happening and you're casting me away and this and that? What does Henry say to her? Shut up. <laughs> know your place, woman. Yeah. So it's all got to do with the favor of the king. And Catherine, for example, knew fine well what kind of person Henry was. So she, I think she exercised her influence on him behind the scenes more than she did. And un unless, you know, he's like, well, now we're not married. And she's like, wait a second, wait a second. Let me, let me pull out my Spanish robes and, and put on a show here at Blackfriars. Yeah. And I, I mean, Shakespeare wrote about it because it was so iconic to sh just show up there and just kneel in front of him. And she'd done these, this same tactic other times for example uh i want to say it's 1518 uh, evil may day when um that that conflict between the art the english artisans and the foreign artisans arose and there was uh, murders in london and a lot of uh, unrest uh and henry um is, sends orders to like capture all these people and they're gonna be um he's like everyone's gonna chop off their heads you know because it's henry the eighth <laughs> and it's Catherine, and I think it's Margaret Tudor is there too, and Mary Rose, and the three queens appear in public and kneel before the king to ask for pardon them. You know, it that's that the queen's the queen had to be someone that behaved very really well so she could exercise her power and her influence when she needed to, like in that that sense. And Henry does pardon them. It's been said, well, it was orchestrated. Yes, but you still had to have a favor of the king for this to be able to happen, right? Right, yes. I just think that um, one of the things that Anne Boleyn didn't know how to do was play a role. Sometimes you had to play the role of just being, just just like they say in, in, in Ireland, keep your clagger shut, you know, <laughs> and just leave it for later or have another tactic. So, yeah, in that I, sense. It makes me wonder if it has more to do with the upbringing between Catherine of Aragon and Anne Boleyn. Clearly, Catherine of Aragon had a much more regal, royal upbringing. She knew how to behave. She was mm -hmm. taught these things, whereas Anne Boleyn maybe was more of a witness to it. I, don't, I guess I don't know how else to describe that. Exactly. Uh, remember that Catherine of Aragon was betrothed to Arthur Tudor in a very public ceremony at three years old in Medina del Campo. And she's already there sitting on her mother's lap, resting on her hip. She's there. And when Columbus comes back and all the shenanigans that happens in Barcelona and all these the momentous historical things that are happening in the reign of her parents, and she's there for all these ceremonies and for them to become the most powerful king and queen in Europe. And she's seen her mother act on all the time on this for years and years, for 16 years until she goes to England. Also, I think we have to not judge people by what they learn, but also the way they learn things. So I think Catherine took that as 
well, I'm not going to be a queen regnant, but I'm going to be a queen consort. So she adapted those things in England too. And then she was just, she had a very pleasant personality. She she didn't, she I think she truly didn't enjoy confrontation. She wasn't, all the ambassadors describe her as someone who always had a smile on her face. But I think on the other hand, she always, always knew her place and what was her duty. And duty came first, came even before motherhood for Catherine Aragon duty. So it's it's a balance between your personality and what you have seen. I think in the case of Anne Boleyn, we have to remember that she's not royalty. She's not raised in a, in a royal court. Uh, she's not raised with tutors like Alexander Geraldini, who is a living humanist in Europe. Um, she's not raised like this. She's So the time where she gets its experience is when Catherine of Aragon sends her to Margaret of Austria, her friend. This is the time where she becomes fashionable. This is the time when she learns how to be uh, a European lady, really, because I think the fascination with Anne Boleyn when she comes back is she's a European lady. She's not just an English lady anymore. And I think what Anne Boleyn did have was that she was she was uh, very good at capturing those things too. She was smart, very smart. And, sh and using that in your advantage is amazing. So despite the fact that she wasn't raised as royalty, we have to give her her, her place because she did something amazing. I mean, she turned the monarchy around, didn't she? <laughs> you could say that. <laughs> <laughs> and then she and then she had to have a lot of uh also like she had to be brave because Catherine of Aragon was a very loved queen in England not by, by Henry obviously at the end <laughs> but her subjects loved her there was people booing her Anne Boleyn in her coronation it was it wasn't a popular there's this fascination about Anne Boleyn now but she wasn't liked in England at the time by the majority of the people. The majority of the t people thought that what she was doing to Catherine Aragon was very unfair. And because it's a rupture, now we see it as, well, you know, people are entitled to be happy in these things. Not at that time and not with a king who, and this is also a problem, Henry VIII's reign is starting to decline in this time too. That's my perspective on it. So this is the beginning of a decline. And I think people think because he he ended up with this woman it's never the king's fault right it's always right. put on the women too which is very unfair but it is the way that it goes the king is is the king and he's never going to yeah. be at fault Catherine Varian never once said it was Henry VIII's fault she always said it was his advisors bad advisors things like that but never once blamed Henry mm -hmm. do you think she really loved him yes I truly think she really loved him. I don't think that she understood love like we do. I think that she knew that, and again, I talk about this all the time, providence. God had, had chosen her to be Queen of England, and that was the King of England that she had to marry. Yes, she had to love him because that was, she had to love him because God had told her to love him, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And when I say we don't understand, we shouldn't understand her motherhood like we understand it now, she loved her, she loved God above her daughter too. So, I mean, it's it's a different, totally different way of understanding love than we do. It's not in a romantic sense, more in a, um, this is my duty and I love doing my duty because it's going to, it's it's for my salvation, which is the end goal of life, really. Yeah. You know, I'm going to have That's, to bring it, I have to bring it up now. That was Emma. deep. That was deep. <laughs> Well, you and I had a discussion last night, a private discussion. I think it was last night. Maybe it was the night before. Anyway, you just brought up some things from that. Now I'm going to have to talk about it because okay. the universal question is always, did they or didn't they between Arthur and Catherine? And oh. I think um, I think I have made it clear what my stance on it was. But I have to admit, after talking to you the other night, I'm starting to lean more in the other direction because of how pious she was. So obviously, for those who don't know, I 
my belief has been for a very long time because I was raised Catholic is that she could have lied and then just gone to confession and done her penance and mm-hmm. all was well. Right. Yeah. But Emma, you kind of added something to it that maybe I hadn't considered. So why don't you tell me again? <laughs> well, first of all, I was raised Catholic too. So I know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but I'm afraid you're wrong, Rebecca. I don't think they did it. Um, And there's many reasons why. First of all, um, one of the things that I like to think about in this sense is believing someone who never changes a story. And Catherine, since day one, said they they hadn't done it. She did admit, and this is for someone who's basically saying they didn't do it, she did admit they slept together in the same bed for, for seven nights, different nights. But I think what happened is they did sleep together, but nothing happened. That's a, that's what she said. And to me, for someone who, two people who were so young, so inexperienced, makes total sense to me. They weren't in a rush either. They weren't rushing them. Uh, the The fact that they did a public bedding and all that, that is that is a ceremonial. But these young people were, were expected to get to know each. I mean, they weren't totally... Uh, they were expected to grow to like each other, to these happen a bit more organically. That's why Catherine wasn't sent until she was basically almost a woman. Let's see, it's a bit cruel to say because she was very young. But you know what I mean, until she was able to understand where things should go in a marriage, right? Let's <laughs> just leave it at that. Let's leave it at that. Um, but in the case of Arthur, we have to think that also the boys were raised in a way that it was, what experience did he have? Zero. And then the next, the first night he's ready to go. You know, I I just, that that was my first suspicion always is like, you know, it's, they're too young really to understand the, and zero experience. It's not like today where everybody's learning things from the internet, from school, from this, from that. Right. That's the first thing I think is very important to know. And then the fact that she always denied it. And the fact that when Alexandra Giraldini said that he did think that they had consummated she shunned him for the rest of his life. Wow. And he was sent back to Spain. And her dueña was outraged that he would have said that because she said, I assure you that this has not happened. Mm -hmm. And this was a great offense to say to a Spanish infanta who above all had to be honest and chaste. Yes. Okay. So the other part of my argument that I want you to touch on too is that not only did I think she could confess and do penance, but that she would also do anything to keep her daughter in the line of succession or keep her daughter protected. What's your argument against that? No, I don't think she would have done something against her conscience and against her salvation and against God. And she said that many times that she wouldn't. So one of the things that she says when Woolsey comes in is like, well, you're not queen anymore and this and that. Um, And then she gets this document where she's not addressed as queen anymore that she has to sign and she asks for a quill and she crosses out every reference to princess and writes queen (laughs) um and she for all the restraint that she had she says and i talked about a, a paper that i did in the renaissance society of america about this she says i cannot admit to have been the harlot of the king for 24 years she cannot it's it's not possible to admit what is not hasn't happened and this is an insult to me so i don't think she would have done it to keep mary i think she was done it doing it for herself she was like you calling me a liar and you know and then i think the other argument and she went to the black friars trial and the first thing that she said to henry was when she was kneeling you know i came and made to you and you know why she said that because when for Empress Isabella of Portugal sent to to find out about, you know, the witnesses that were gathered, all those people that were with Catherine when, when she had been married to Arthur, um, they found her chamberwoman, Catalina de Motril, and she declared, and this is a bit, you know, but she declared that the morning after um, Henry and Catherine had slept together for the first time, there was blood in the sheets. The king never doubted that she was a virgin when he married her. She was paraded in London as a virgin. Mm. So Henry then thought, changed his mind 25 years down the line and finds these guys to say things like, I was in the midst of Spain. Really? 
Right. Are we going to believe that story? Are we yeah. really not going to see through that and pass that? I don't think she was lying about that. I think it would have taken so much to lie about that when, I mean, maybe I could because I don't have that idea about um, my ultimate goal in life is to, you know, favor God. But Catherine did believe her salvation was the most important, even more important than being Queen of England was being chaste and honest and not lying about the things she said to God. And she swore on God many times that she had not had sex with Arthur. They had slept together. They had not had sex. I believe it. I think that's the most compelling argument to me that you make is how chaste she was and what her salvation meant to her. That clicks in my head a little bit more because I think (laughs) I think I keep forgetting that it wasn't just once that she was asked, you know, oh, she was just asked once and she said, oh, no, or, you know, it was several times, which then gives it a whole different weight. She was asked the second it happened, the second he died, she was asked. She was asked, and and and, and remember that she was very sick when Arthur died, so yeah. it probably had the same illness, right? And it's Elizabeth of, of York, the queen who sends for a little, because... Uh, Queen Isabel just goes crazy. She's like, get her out of there. Why is she still there? You know, because they're very concerned she's going to die. So they they take her back to London. And and that's the first thing they ask her. Her mom asks her that privately in the reports. They could have, they could, you know, and all the reports say that she's a virgin. All the reports say that she's a virgin. And... Uh, the only person in her household that says she's that he thinks it's been consummated is Alexandro Geraldini, and he's out of the picture unless that you can say Geraldini. I mean, he's out. <laughs> he's out. And he even goes on to go to America and he even sends gifts to her and like, I'm sorry. And she's like, uh, no, no. Because truly this was how important it was to her. Her, um, her honesty. Her honesty was the most important thing because it was her honesty to God, not to Henry, not to her mother. That's why I don't think she would have lied over and over and over. And she never changed the story. That's a very typical thing of someone who's saying the truth. Right. She never, And she did admit to sleeping with him, which for a very chaste Catholic woman, that was a, a lot to admit. Those That could have had implications for her admitting that she had slept with him because people could have said seven nights, nothing happened. I truly believe nothing happened. I, you know what, Emma, Dr. Emma, I think you've changed my mind. <laughs> oh, well, and you know, the important, the, the thing about it, we'll never know. But the most likely explanation is that she was not lying, that nothing happened because they probably didn't know what to do very well. And <laughs> what if it happened eventually? Of course. Right. Would she have had children with Arthur if he had lived? Of course. She, but it's just, she was saying the truth. I only had six nights with it. What do you want me to do? <laughs> I, I feel like in my head, it makes more sense when I compare Catherine to Thomas More. I mean, he would not go against his conscience, right? And so it was similar for her in that respect. And he died to hold on to what was in his conscience. And think, uh, uh, yeah, that's exactly, that's that's a very good comparative because it's true. And these people were obsessed with their salvation. They would not, they were, and they were scared. I mean, think about, and not only the Catholics, think of Luther and all the things he says, but, Mm -hmm. you know, they were truly scared of, of the wrath of God. So we have to understand that for her to lie over and over, and let's think of the other side. Has Henry Henry VIII ever been known to lie? Come Mm -hmm. on. He's the biggest lie in the history of mankind. Come on. Well, I don't know about that, but close. No, I, you know, it's just sometimes I think, why is there a debate over this? But it's so obvious to me, especially when you read those uh, reports of, of the servants of Arthur. And he was like, I mean, Arthur Tudor was not a six foot four, 25 year old, you know, robust. Uh, no, he died like he, he got a, he died. He was. By the way, when they were married, he was, she was a tiny woman, Catherine Aragon. He's described even shorter than her and smaller than mm-hmm. her. I think he just had a problem, honestly. Well, his portrait, been... he doesn't look very, very developed in his portrait. You know, and the only portrait of him, 
painted at Vivum, and we can talk more about what at Vivum represents, means that it was painted during his life. It's in Heba Castle. In that portrait, look at him. He looks like a boy. He doesn't look like someone who's ready for marriage and children, does he? No. And this is painted, you know, right before, probably right before he dies. Yeah. The best way for me to describe it is he looks delicate. Yes, exactly. And, and yeah, and like Juan, you know, and Juan did, uh, Juan, so Catherine's sister did uh, marry Margaret of Austria and they did uh, do the deed because Margaret is pregnant when he, when he dies. So, I mean, sometimes it did happen. Sometimes like in the case of Catherine of Aragon, I think it didn't. I think that she was, they were both willing for it to happen. They got married with all the consequences, just the way things developed. It just didn't work very well. Mm. Okay, I have a what if question for you, because sometimes these are a little bit fun. What if Henry Mm -hmm. VIII had not met Anne Boleyn and just stayed with Catherine? What would the outcome, do you think, have been? He would have met someone else. I don't think Mm -hmm. Anne Boleyn was someone special for him. It was just, it was uh, Charles V, marries Elizabeth, uh, Isa- Isabella of, of Portugal, breaking his commitment to Mary Tudor. And and that's when Henry decides he's done with Catherine of Aragon. And I think he, if it wasn't Anne Boleyn, and that, he shows that because then he loves Anne Boleyn, but five minutes later, he loves someone else. So I think he would just would have found, he just needed a, a young woman to give him a son. What we all know he was obsessed with, having a son. Right, which uh, makes so- sense. Yeah, it makes sense. Of course it makes sense. There had never been a woman on the throne of England. Probably Catherine was telling him every day, but my mother, he's like, this is not Spain, Catherine, come on. <laughs> I get his side too. I mean, I'm not totally against what Henry was trying to do because I get it. It's, it's difficult. The Tudors, his dad arrived to the throne in very suspicious circumstances and, well, winning in battle and all that. So they weren't that assured in the throne. It's just that uh, he should have been able to see see that in Europe what was happening at the time is like some women had to rule because it was just too difficult and too complex for these very uh, weak lines like his, because his sons just keep dying, to, to perpetuate. I mean, remember that Catherine and Henry had a boy in 1511, yeah. Henry. So it's um, I think he was just like, this woman has not given me what I want she's so i'm just gonna move on to someone else yeah. i don't think Anne Boleyn. i think Anne Boleyn was circumstantial i don't think that she was special to him to be honest you know i wonder had henry fitzroy lived if yes. he would have been named an heir and i suspect i'm just gonna throw this out there yeah I don't, I don't have a whole lot of evidence on it but i suspect henry fitzroy may have been poisoned as well <gasps> Okay, when are we doing the poison episode? <laughs> well, we're really adding to the list here, yeah. aren't we? We got quite a few. Yeah, and 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 Henry Fitzroy, he does. I mean, this does upset a lot, Catherine, and it, when he gets, um, he, he's becoming a duke and this and that because it is a threat, and it's always a threat when a, when a, a king that only has a daughter has a bastard son, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um. This is what Game of Thrones is based on, the, the, the Tudors and, and the Trastamaras and all this. So it is a threat. Catherine gets really upset when he he gets favored. And she doesn't get upset for other things that should upset her. So, yeah, I mean, there was many interests there for, for that boy not to to continue, too. Right. So, I mean, yeah. we, ha- we had both Mary and Elizabeth alive mm-hmm. at the same time as henry fitzroy exactly. so who you know we have the the catholics and maybe those on mm-hmm. anne Boleyn's side who were more reformers quietly and maybe back then a little bit more um uh, who whose interest was to put their relative on the throne next exactly so- and i think it's also uh foreign influence versus english uh interests too we have to think that foreign influence in England is always uh, taken suspiciously by many of the members of the gentry and nobility. Um, so these are interests that are go further than religion. I, I and because religion at this point is just such a mess too. The Catholic religion too is just transforming too. 
But I think it goes deeper than that. I think there's a lot of court interests. And when the people start to see that Catherine's influence over Henry is declining, because first Woolsey is uh, coming to power, and then all the influence that Woolsey has on on Henry and on the French alliance, right? Yeah. But then after that, in in when Catherine clearly is is becoming out of the picture, um, everybody wants to have Henry's favor too, because someone has to be the next one. Um, and you know, if we can kick out these Spaniards, then maybe we can get in and have a piece of the cake, you know? Yeah. So that's I, I think it's got to do a lot of with, with that too. I don't know what you think. Yeah, I you know. The other thing I find interesting about all of this is you mentioned the betrothal between Mary and Charles V mm -hmm. and the big age difference between the two. Mm -hmm. It makes me want to scratch my head a little bit and go, what was Henry thinking? Like, how upset could he really be that Charles broke it and married somebody closer in age to him so that he could have heirs? Exactly. But if we look back at Henry's uh, personality, he would just behave like this when he didn't get his way. He threw a huge tantrum when Ferdinand of Aragon uh, um, in, in the 1510s when they both went to war together and Ferdinand um, negotiated the peace with France without letting him know. Actually, the the report is sent to, to Catherine's council and it's Catherine who protests against her, her dad and she says, you can't treat the King of England like a boy. He's not a boy anymore. Well, he, clearly he was because <laughs> his wife was, was arranging his things for him. Uh, but it just happens and he's just, he can't take the fact that Charles is more powerful than him. And they can and he can actually do this and say like, well, I don't need you right now. So it was great, but you know. So it's just, you know, whenever you humiliated Henry in his in his view, he would just have a fit and do something extreme. So this to me it's just not surprising that he did all of this. Is is just he was like, I'm fed up with these these um Hasbergs that, you know, smile one day and then the next day they're like sorry you're not important enough you know and to tell henry the eighth he wasn't important enough imagine how it must have been that because we see him uh i'm not sure i'm going to be very popular for saying this but we see in in the in england people see him as this great big european figure well uh breaking news he's not that big in europe he tries to be emperor he, he doesn't succeed he he tags along for like artistic innovation let's think about that one of the, my fields of expertise there's always someone else who is doing the job for him it's either Catherine Baragon, Woolsey so I mean I think it's just because he marries six wives and he chops heads off and things like that and because he has this huge break with Rome he becomes very famous and popular he's not that important or relevant and he knew it <laughs> because the important and relevant people were Francis I of France and Charles V who were the ones battling in Italy, the territories for, between each other, who were, you know, dominating more Charles. Charles is the arguably the most powerful man in the Renaissance. Yeah. So, you know, Henry just couldn't take it, I think. It bruised his ego, his very delicate ego. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. I mean, anyone who's, who knows a little bit about Henry VIII, this, has, this is not a surprise, right? He just had a fragile ego. Yeah. And he thought he was more than he really was. He wasn't that relevant in European history. He wanted to Oops. be. He wanted to be. He was a wannabe. He was the kid that was like, look at me. I'm over here. Mm. Look what I can do. Yeah. Can yeah. And they were like, lives. yeah. Great, great job. I think my favorite. So one of the other kings that I despise is Francis I. Francis I was horrible, especially to women. He was a horrible man to women. He was a great monarch and he was an outstanding patron of the arts. He um, was able to bring Leonardo da Vinci to France. Imagine how important and relevant he is. But my favorite thing is when the Battle of the Egos, when Francis and Henry meet and the fl field of cloth of gold is just a battle of egos and they can't help each uh, help themselves and they have a fight. <laughs> If that is not telling you well, those two people, men, were like, I don't know what will, you know, because they just have a fight in front of everyone. And Francis wins, by the way. 
uh, how Henry must have felt after that. I, yeah, I, it's funny because I've just been rewatching the Tudors again. It's been quite a few years. And whenever I watch that show, sometimes it confuses the history I know. Mm. You know, I'm like, wait, I saw that. No, that's not right. That wasn't true. But the Field of Cloth of Gold I just watched recently and that the scene where they're wrestling and Francis throws him down and how upset Henry is well, says yes. a lot. And behind let's talk about behind the scenes there so they have a fight imagine how henry felt humiliated yeah and then they go back to england but they stop in calais they stop in calais and they see charles <laughs> they see charles the fifth because he right. comes he comes to to make a point that if henry wants to be his ally and henry who is probably still bruised from his fight with francis uh, that's when he starts negotiations to betroth Mary to. So Henry's basically like, I'm going to be Charles's friend now, you know, because right. Henry, yes, because Fred, and this is when, this is a bomb today, okay? Ooh. This is when there's a woman, and this is a Venetian ambassador who are the best people in the world because they give us all the gossip. Uh, he says that when they are in Calais, they do a big uh, feast for Charles. And that there's a woman that gives Charles a portrait of himself. And then he gives her a chain, a very expensive chain. This is a woman artist. And he and Charles V is rewarding her for this uh, portrait. If it's a woman, she's in the queen's household. And this portrait, a portrait by by one of the leading uh, Flemish uh, artists that, that introduced Renaissance portraiture into England, the Harmbouts, uh, we've talked about them again. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a portrait of Charles V. A miniature portrait in the um, Victoria Albert Museum that must probably was that portrait that uh, Susanna Harnberg gave to to Charles in Calais. So imagine how smart Catherine was that after she, he has the fight with Francis, he's like, "But look at my my nephew. He's nice. Don't you think he's good for our Mary?" <laughs> right. Yes. And we have another miniature, Harmbout miniature in the National Portrait Gallery in London, that it's Mary, and she's wearing a little brooch that says the Emperor in French. So these are probably the portraits that were very that Susanna painted. So to, for Catherine to say, great, he had a fight with Francis, let's, let's make this happen. In 1522, they reached the agreement, and that document that is now in the Archivo General de Simancas in Spain has an illuminated initial where Henry is there, enthroned under a canopy made by a Tudor rose and a pomegranate. If that doesn't have mm. Catherine of Aragon all over it and her and boots, and let's let's bring this amazing art to convince Henry and seal this deal and marry Mary to to Charles, because the her boots had been working for Margaret of Austria and Charles V too. So this is Catherine is using art and and portraiture. To convince Henry after a huge fight with Francis. It just goes to show how important those visual items were during this time. And how smart women were. Because Catherine said to Susanna, now is the time. Do it. Give him the portrait. <laughs> Henry's still, you know. Because they were still technically in France. I mean, Calais was, was English. Uh, but mm -hmm. they were still in France. So and it was. It, this is just days after this fill of cloth of gold. But because... The Spanish alliance hasn't been studied in depth before. These pieces of, of information are lost to us. And then we just get the big picture of Francis and and, and 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 Henry are these two big rivals. But Charles is always there, in and out. He's the only emperor mm. of the Holy Roman Empire who visits England. Wow. Twice, I think. Twice, yeah, twice. That's impressive. That's during the time that Catherine is his ambassadress. She's always... So two things we have to remember is her other objective was to advance the alliance. She would, she remained a Spaniard until her death. She says this. She's when she's in the in the Blackfriars trial. She says, "I'm a foreigner. I don't have friends here." And she realizes that once the favor of the king is, she's lost it. Everybody's hostile, really, because nobody wants to be allowed the one that you know is against the king. Yeah, really. Yeah. So oh. it, she always fought for the interests of Charles. Uh, going back to the the idea of the daughters, Charles is the son of Juana of Castile. So Catherine, she he calls 
Catherine and Henry, my uncle and my aunt. So this is how close these, and this is how important these um, uh, daughters of Isabella become in, in European history. Yeah. Because the most powerful man in the 16th century was the son of one of them, Charles V. Emma, seriously, we have covered so much information again today. Yes. <laughs> I want to thank you for all of your knowledge again. Um, I don't even know how to like title this episode because we covered yeah. so much, but I'll figure I'll figure something out. But to end, I think I want to I want to go back to my roots and something that I used to do with some of my previous guests. And I'm going to ask you if you could safely travel back in time to any one moment, let's say within in the history that you're comfortable with, um, what moment would you want to go back to and be an observer? The moment I just described, 1520 Calais, Susanna Horenboot giving Charles V the portrait that she had painted. This is way before Sofonis Van Guisola and the other, Levina Turnlick and the other women artists that we know about. I'm so proud to have made this discovery. It's it's amazing to think that these women were playing the highest of politics involving art and something as cool as portraiture, which is one of my favorite things, as you know. So if I could have been there, oh, maybe in that banquet too, you know, they probably had a good time. Right. You know? <laughs> and seeing Henry all bruised, oh my goodness. Yes, that's the moment I want to go back to. Wonderful. Well, Emma, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you. Have a great day. <laughs>